there is a, there's a scholar named Ellen Davis who says you can think back to the Old Testament and you can pay attention to this reality that the people who, you know, were sort of wanting to be wise, who wanting to, to, to arrive at some definition of wisdom, that the ones who tried to do it through means of power often uh, did not arrive in a place of wisdom. It actually went pretty sideways for them. And they harmed themselves. They sometimes harmed other people in the process. But the people who really pushed towards the concept of goodness, not a human definition of goodness, not just a reductionist 21st century, everybody just be a good human, like, but, but like God's picture of goodness, um, often out of that from whatever position or station they found themselves in, lowly or uh, on, in a high place, they seem to be the ones that arrived at that place of wisdom. And I love the quote from Alice Walker that appeared on the screen in the bumper. You might have missed it. Like, like, but like the, what we can do with this picture of power is, is sort of feel right? Like the, the tension that I've already mentioned that like, yeah, but how do you choose a different way when I've got all these other pressures coming at us? But then there's another, there's another mistake I think we make, which is just to dismiss the idea that we have any kind of influence at all, that we have any kind of role to play in bringing God's picture of goodness to the world. So what we've wanted to do in this series is just pay attention to how Jesus leverages, talks about, lives out um, a, a, a definition of power and, and success that, that can arrive and meet us in our story, can meet us in, in the areas where we need grace, can meet us in the areas where we need truth, and can meet us in the areas where we find ourselves just constantly striving towards other streams. And, and so, so today we want to continue in that by looking at Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. So this is a moment, last week we looked at like the beginning of a formal sermon Jesus preached. Now this is a moment that's kind of an off-the-cuff situation. This is a moment where, where, where people that are walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus and interacting with Jesus, uh, much like you might on a road trip, the kind of things that come up when you, you just think about like you've got hours in a car together, right? The things you talk about that might be different than the formal setting. So this is a moment we're going to pay attention to in Jesus's life where it's, it's, it's not a formal moment of teaching, but it follows a moment where Jesus has sort of shared something really important about how Jesus's kingdom and picture of success and picture of power is going to come about. So Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, we're going to pay attention to it uh, here and then say a couple things about it that might fill out the context for us and, uh, and let it invite us and challenge us this morning. So chapter 20, verse 20, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine might sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? They can. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, beautiful passage of Scripture, one that you're perhaps familiar with, but we got to say a couple things about it to round out its context. The first is that, if you don't know, Jesus has got um, kind of a, a group of 12 that are known as his disciples. Lots of people follow Jesus, interact with Jesus, like his teachings, walking with him, talking with him, but there's 12, a group of men that we come to know as the disciples, um, that are the, kind of in that inner sanctum, that would be the ones taking the road trip largely with Jesus. And uh, of those 12, you've got three 
um, two of which are the sons of Zebedee that are kind of the, you know, like on the little more on the inside track, right? Like it's not that Jesus, you know, likes them more than the other 12, but just a little bit more time, a little bit more of an investment. Think about your circles of friendships, how you might have 12 different friends, but there's a couple that are like your best buddies, your closest circle, the ones you're going to be a little more vulnerable with. Um, and, that's, and that's where some of this conversation is generating out of, some of that inner circle conversation. Now, this is interesting because it follows a moment where Jesus has just told them in the preceding passage that he's going to die. That, like, the way that this thing's going to be brought about is ultimately through Jesus' death. All right? So get your mind around the essence of the question. To sit at the left and to sit at the right would be a political conversation. Think about the cabinet that a president has or the positions of power or a vice president. And that's kind of the context that the conversation is, is being brought up in. Now, another piece I think you need to know, because I think it helps us just even in our own little moment, like, ask good questions of scriptures, um, that when Mark records this particular passage, Mark doesn't bring up that it's the mom that initiates the conversation, brings up it's the guys that do it. It's the sons that bring this up. So, so why is that the case? Uh, it could mean a couple different things. Theologians are wrestling with this. Like it could mean that uh, the, the, the mom is the one that brought it up. You know, that like um, it could mean that it was, it was her idea, and she kind of put it, the idea in the boys' heads, like, hey, you guys, you, you roll with Jesus, you're tight with Jesus, so when Jesus' kingdom comes about, like, just, I'm going to put, and if you're not going to put it out there, I am, right? That, that's how it could go. The other way it could have gone, and, and this is what some people think, is that, like, like Mark's kind of cutting to the chase, that it was more of a situation where it was like, it's their idea, but they did the thing that you did when you were like siblings. You know, like, let's have the youngest go ask mom and dad. Like, the one that like they're most sympathetic towards. And like, and their mom is connected to Mary. So like, there's a good, we'll have mom ask. And so Mark, what Mark might be doing, theologians think, is just kind of cutting to the chase and going like, yeah, mom may have said it, but it was her, it was their idea. It was, the, it was the guys and their idea. The, the other possibility is that this is a two-part conversation, right? Like when, you know, when your kid or, or someone you've ever been babysitting, and they're like, hey, can we go to McDonald's, and you just trying to change the subject? You're like, hey, look, it's really nice outside today, and you want to talk about something else. Um, and then you, you have that whole conversation, and you think maybe they've forgotten, and then they're like, yeah, but are we going to go to McDonald's or not? That, that, that what Matthew and Mark might be highlighting in their complementary texts, because the tail end of it is exactly the same, is that this may be like more of an extended off-the-cuff conversation that may have gotten interrupted, right? I think this is just good things for us to think about and, and, and dive into in, in the sense of just every time we're opening the Bible, we're sort of wrestling with its authority in our life in some way, right? And, and so if you read the Mark passage, you're like, wait, back here, it was, it was the mom that said something. And, and so I think this is all helpful for this conversation, all right? But what's happening in the conversation, in this off-the-cuff conversation about, uh, about these definitions of power, okay? I think the first one is that Jesus is helping them and consequently us wrestle with and think about what it means to call Jesus king. What it means to call Jesus king. Their baseline definition is that they're going to have a cabinet position in the seat of power. Like their baseline definition is a political one. There's a particular, uh, you know, political system in the first century. There's a particular hierarchy that they can relate to. There's some things that they've swallowed and memorized about what, it, what the Messiah is going to do for them, like as a people, and so it's a really easy baseline definition to go, hey, when all that comes about, if who you are is who you say you are and all that good stuff, like, then we're kind of in the, the inner sanctum. Like, what's in it for us? Now, I think what's interesting about Jesus is, is of course, like, uh, this, I, I mean, and maybe you can relate to it in the frustration that Jesus has. Like, if you're looking at this passage through the lens of Jesus— it's really frustrating because this is your inner circle. Like this is coming from an insider. This is not coming from a random person that doesn't know you, that doesn't know what you're about. I mean, this is presumably from people who are walking with you, talking with you, and not just walking with you and talking with you, tight with you. Hey, just after predicting your death for another time, when you get to that position, what, what role are we going to play in all of this? 
Right, if we look at the passage from Jesus' point of view, I think one of the things that's really helpful for us to see the character of God and the love of God is that uh, he basically lands it with, you don't know what you're asking, as opposed to how you or I might handle such an interaction with like, you idiots, what did I just say? I just told you I was going to die. Like, I just told you. Like, like, there's a sense in which we can just, again, see the character and nature of Jesus inviting us, challenging us, thinking about a better question that digs below the layers of our assumptions. That's part of what it means to call Jesus king. This is the lifelong work of being a disciple of Jesus is, is like being in that posture. But if we, look at the, if we look at the passage through the lens of the disciples, right, I think it exposes something to us. Remember that they've, they've been in proximity with Jesus. They've heard him teach. They've heard and seen and witnessed miracles. They've heard off-the-cuff conversations. And yet, they're still on some level projecting onto Jesus their own human political pictures of what it will mean for Jesus to be Lord and for Jesus to be King. And the thing Jesus is always moving them towards is that the way that the, Jesus is going to build character, the way Jesus is going to transform human hearts is not just through the, the, the climbing of a corporate ladder and the gaining of external political power. That that's not going to be the way. And yet Jesus is not apolitical. To call Jesus Lord is to say that Caesar, to say that Herod is not. So, so on some level, right, like, like one of the things that's just good for us to pay attention to, like we can see James and John here, and particularly if we read the, the previous passage and we can go, oh, okay, like you, you send your mom in to ask the question, you know, or you ask the question. And this right after Jesus has just told you something that like for us who know how the story ends at this point is very crystal clear to us what Jesus is talking about. This seems silly that you would ask a question like this, but I think it's really important for us to know how our earthly and baseline pictures of power and success and making it and arriving and living my best life are all on some level standing in contrast to the kingdom that Jesus is actually offering us. Right? And I think this happens on an individual level, right? That our pictures of attraction and lust and identity and money and partisanship and, and, and justice on some level, right? There's, there's, in one of those areas, you're like, yeah, yeah, get them. Tell the people. One of those areas, you feel really, really good and really, really strong that you, you and Jesus are like this. You're like aligned on that topic. And then, and then there's probably some area where you're like, yeah, please don't talk about this one. Like, don't mention this one, this hard thing that Jesus has to say. But I think it exposes, like, James and John's interaction here, the sons of Zebedee's interaction here, mom's interaction here with Jesus, a posture of our heart, which is that we're always in a position where we're trying to really understand what it means to call Jesus Lord and King when we have functional baseline definitions of, like, our own kingdoms that we are quite happy with. Thank you very much. And Jesus is always challenging us to get a, 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 a more robust picture of what Jesus' kingship is really offering us. Not just for our own hearts, but I think also for the people we put trust in. Right? Because at least some of this conversation, at least some of this conversation is that uh, you like, well, well, hey, like, I feel pretty good about where I am, but, like, I also have a definition of, like, the people I put in power, the people I, I, I put into to high stature, and how they would have things go. Um, Diane Langberg, in her book, Redeeming Power, it provides a really challenging example of this by, by sharing a quote from a person in history that, um, that, that probably some folks would hear and go, oh, this sounds really good. Let me read you the quote, um, and I won't tell you who said it. He's, this person says, Today Christianity stands at the head of this country. I pledge that I will never tie myself to those who want to destroy Christianity. We want to fill our culture with the Christian spirit. We want to burn out all the recent immoral development in literature, theater, the arts, and the press. We want to burn out all the poison of immorality which has entered into our whole life and culture as a result of the liberal excess of the past few years. 
like you, you would sort of expect someone who is some kind of leader or spiritual authority to make such a claim. What may shock you is that it's Adolf Hitler that said it. Speaking to a group of faith leaders, trying to convince them, well, if you put your trust in me, then it'll be okay. And you're going to get what you want. And what makes us all cringe and a bit uncomfortable here is that it didn't happen that like that. <laughs> didn't happen like that at all. It was the way of this particular person was antithetical to the way of Jesus, but the words enticed the ears, enticed the heart. And this speaks again to, the, I think, the tension that the sons of Zebedee are wrestling with. Like, like, let's find a person with momentum and inertia and power that we can, we, and then we can get into their graces and then we can really do good things. And Jesus, again, says, you don't know what you're asking because you don't really know, you don't pay attention to until you really think about the state of your own heart. And so one of the things Jesus is inviting us to consider is, is the, the way that in this, you don't know what you're asking in his response, the way that the false needs that we often have can, can be exploited in our own flesh by, by the pictures of success that we're given, but also by the people who are selling us a picture of their success, right? There's, there's five false needs Steve Cuss talks about, the need for control, the need for perfection, the need to know the answer, the need to be there for others, the need for approval. And I think maybe you can relate to those on some level. I can see myself in each of them in some manner. Like I can feel right now, right? Who, haven't, who, who of us haven't in the past three years tried to cling to some picture of control and just wanting to know the answer? Who of us does like to be the person that disappoints other people? Not me. Like we all want to know the answer. We all want to be known as a person who's there for others or can, 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 can fill in when we're needed. And we all like to, on some level, find approval, find a place where we're okay, where we're vindicated, where we're good, we're in the in crowd. But, but the reason Cuss calls them false needs, and that guy's name is Steve Cuss, that's why I said Cuss, um, like here's random, random word Cuss, um, is because, in, because Jesus speaks to, particularly in this passage, some of the false needs and assumptions that are being raised, right? First, that God is in control, right? That, 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 that they, they're looking for a picture of position and power. They don't know what they're asking, that like, there's a bigger narrative that's going to happen here. The idea of per, that God is perfect and you are not. Like, the, like their, their reductionist picture is that like if they got into the seat, they would do the right thing all the time. He's like, you don't know what you're asking. Right? The idea of knowing the answer. We, you know, well, God says, I am omniscient. I am present. I am, I'm the present. And that ultimately approval is going to arrive not through striving and arriving in a particular position or station, but through God's grace. And so, and so again, we can look at the, the disciples here with a, a bit of frustration. I, I particularly resonate with the, I, the I, why I chose the Matthew passage is because I think it looks particularly weird when you're like, I'm going to have a mom, I'm going to have mom ask. Like, I'm going to have mom call. Like, hooray for mom. Like, good on mom. Like, that's a great mom right there. But like, but, like, it, I think it does sort of show a window. And we can, we can look at them with a space of, like, just shaking our heads. But what we might miss is the areas in our own space where, where in our attempt to follow the kings and powers of this world, we might make similar confusing mistakes. We might cling to similar false needs. And I think the encouragement here, if we find some encouragement in this, is that for the— I mean, especially because those who really were on the left and right of Jesus— at the end of Matthew, were, were the thieves being crucified, right? One of whom was like, hey, remember me. <laughs> and, and that was the posture by which that thief on the cross received grace and mercy. This is why Jesus, again, says, you don't know what you're asking. And so the, I think the journey of the human heart is to, is to continue to grow in uh, our understanding of what it means to call Jesus Lord, and, and then find encouragement that this is a lifelong journey. Like, everything I've said up to this point has not been intended to say, like, well, there you go again. Messing it up. Getting it wrong. There you go again. Hurting, hurting the people around you. There you go again. Choosing the things that could never deliver what they promised. There you go again. That's, that's, that's not... That's not uh, 
That's not the invitation. The invitation here is to continually allow the lordship of Jesus to speak into the systems and structures we've just adopted and run with in our culture and time that they're just supposed to tell us that we're going to be okay, right? So when Jesus says this in verses 24 through 26, he says, when the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. So real easy for them to say, right? Like, you guys, can't believe you guys, like, jockeying for position, as if they themselves don't constantly do the exact same kind of nonsense, right? Funny stuff there. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and the high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. That will stop at the not so with you. The not so with you here is to say, hey, I've given you a different path. I've given you a different way. There's something that you need to pay attention to. That, that, that this will be a lifelong journey for us, right? Like when you were a high school senior, you had some picture of success that you were like, oh, this is the picture of success that when I'm 18 years old, I'm supposed to have, I'm supposed to adopt. The guidance counselor told me about. And then at 28, you can look at that and go, okay, that was a little silly. I, I was misinformed about some things. And then at 38, you can go, wow, 28, I was just a fool, Right? Like, and, and there's narratives, right? That like it's, it's this many kids, and this is a house, and it's this level, this many commas behind my take-home pay, and this, this much, this much like, like clout in my area of influence, and it's this many followers on my YouTube channel. I, I don't know what it is for you, but, like, but on some level then, 10 years later, you go, okay, yeah, that was foolish. And the constant journey of our hearts is to let the Lordship of Jesus speak to the baseline assumptions, the areas where Jesus would say, hey, it's over here and it's this way, but not so with you, but not so with you. And to find that as good news, to find that as an encouragement, to find that as a loving God who's walking with us and willing to deal with, on some level, a lot of our own nonsense to help us truly experience the life that Jesus offers. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux says this, that there's really five layers to understanding love. This is, a, this is a 10th century monk who, you know, like when we all say, hey, I'm trying to love God, I'm trying to love people, I'm trying to love myself, like, I think we all understand that there's layers to that, right? Like, um, and, and on some level, what, he's, what he kind of lays out in his kind of pathway of discipleship here is that the, the journey of the human heart is one where you begin with just kind of loving ourselves for our own sake, right? We might call that like just our cultural picture of self-esteem. Like, just feel good about ourselves. Like, you're a masterpiece. You go for it. You go get them. Like, um, you're special. And like, that's good. That's a place to start. Like, that, we don't, we're not rejecting that. But then there's another layer of understanding that, like loving God for our gifts and blessings, like understanding that every good and perfect gift is from above and, and sort of saying, hey, God's provided for me. And then there's another layer beyond that, which is to say, hey, when I don't have those things, is God still God? If I don't have a house, is God still God? If I don't have food on the table this week, if I don't have security for the next generation in my family, is God still God? Loving God for himself alone. The next layer will be loving ourselves for the sake of God, right? Do I, do I see that I am God's workmanship? Do I see that I am part of God's redemption plan? Um, and if I do, then that last layer, loving ourselves the way God loves us, sort of applying then that I might, I might choose different pathways that when it comes to money, sex, or power because of my ability to love myself the way God loves me. Right? That, that's what Clairvaux, Bernard of Clairvaux says. Like, that's the work of discipleship. That's the work of our human hearts and our strivings to, to approximate ourselves to Jesus so that, that we can be in the place where we can receive that not so with you as a good challenge and a good invitation. And to slow down our lives, to slow down, to live out a slow down spirituality in a way that says, hey, it's good for us to wrestle with this. It's good for us to be paying attention to the systems and structures by which we are defining success, by which we are defining arrival, by which we are defining making it. Jesus reminds us in this passage that spiritual contentment arrives not when we fit Jesus into our picture of arrival, but in the picture of servant leadership. 
He said, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, we're often told, and or at least displayed, that, that, that like, you know, the way you achieve greatness is that you accumulate, you step on, you consolidate, you acquire. And the way of Jesus says, no, you, you serve. You serve others. You, you pour yourself out. You see how the Gentiles do it. You see how the Romans do it. You see how Herod the Great does it. We're not going to do it that way. That the very people in this collective, who have been exploited by those powers are not going to find greatness by just getting into those same positions and living out their own picture of it. But but to see the servant leadership of Jesus, to see the servant heart of Jesus, is where we can really find life. In, in Jeremiah 29, this, I'll just say this really quick. It's a, it's a, it's, there's, a, there's a moment where a group of people who, who had not been faithful to God are now in a city that's hostile towards their faith, and there's all kinds of buzz about what to do in that city. Do you, do you, do you stand antagonistically? Do you hold protests? Do you, you know, try to you know, garner a militia? And there's people that are, that are on the outside saying, hey, just wait it out. Just wait it out. It's going to be over soon. Just play the game. You're being punished. Jesus... You know, God, God will get over it, you know. But then, then Jeremiah the prophet says, hey, you know, the way that you will actually think about flourishing in this new place is that if you consider the needs of the city around you, if you consider the needs of other people around you, because if it prospers, you are going to prosper. And, and, I, and if you think about this, right, how many of us approach maybe a view of city or a view of where we live is like, what do I get out of these places, For whatever season I'm here, six months, 60 years, like, how do I get things out of this? How do I milk out of it all that Baltimore can give me, all that the county can give me, all that, you know, wherever I want to live can get me? But but the way Jesus talks about where our proximity and where we live is like, how do the people around me become opportunities to, in my own heart, be reminded of God's kingdom and character, but also to display to them the way that this kingdom works, by serving others, by investing in them, by helping them see in our own striving the goodness of God. This is, this is what the passage in Titus that Julia was talking about earlier was, that like this thing that's working in us is not just a personal salvation that makes us feel warm and fuzzy and forgiven, but it ultimately empowers us to display the love of God in tangible ways. And then it reminds us again that we're not just trying to be good little servants and good little volunteers for the world around us, but that ultimately Jesus is our servant king. That the why, the why for us living that way is not so that we can accumulate, you know, gold stars and, and ribbons from the mayor and commendations from, you know, so we can throw out the first pitch at Camden Yards for the volunteer hero of the month, but because Jesus is our servant king. Because this is what Jesus did for us. And what I'm doing for others is just a reflection of what Jesus is always challenging and helping me to see and understand in my own heart. Like like this idea that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Remembering that like Herod and and the Romans looked at people and said, what can I get out of you to build me? But Jesus said, how can, I, how can I pour myself out so that you can see who I really am? So that you can know that you, you are free from those systems. To give his life as a ransom for many. We don't like that. That word ransom is, is kind of a weird one in our culture, 2023. It infers one very specific thing. But if we think about debt, right? Like, like someone paying your medical debt, someone paying your student loan debt, like someone clearing your car payment, your credit card payment, your mortgage, like, it didn't just disappear when, when someone paid it. it. It was absorbed by someone else. Someone else took upon themselves what the, the fruit of your decisions. And, and this is what Jesus is reminding us here. That I, I get into your mess. I get into where you are in debt. I get to where you feel enslaved and trapped. I want to walk with you through. I want to absorb 
the consequences of those things. Even if you've got to walk out some tough things, I'm going to walk with you in that process, in that journey. There, there was a guy in history named Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. So if you need a name for your cat, I recommend that one. You have an animal to name right now. Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Uh, and as you might imagine, Count Ludwig Nicholas von Zinzendorf had a lot of money. <laughs> he did. He, he, you know, you don't have a name like Count Ludwig Nicholas von Zinzendorf and be like a poor person living on the streets. He turned 19 and had the opportunity, as you might imagine, with a name like Count Ludwig von Nicholas, Zinzen, Nicholas von Zinzendorf, to like kind of tour Europe and like see all the cities and see all the sites. And he stops in Dusseldorf um, and, and looks at a painting. He stops and looks at this painting by a guy named Fetty, which is called Behold the Man in its English translation. And this is Jesus before Pontius Pilate, Jesus before the, the powers and structures that will ultimately put Jesus to death, the very thing he predicts to the disciples. And as so Zinzendorf takes this in, as someone who's acquainted with religiosity and acquainted with kind of a cultural picture of religion in, in Europe, he's moved by the inscription, which says in English, all this I did for thee, what hast thou done for me? In other words, if I really understand the, what Jesus endured and is trying to set me free from, how might I live in distinction to all of the systems and structures that have been set up for me? And it was a catalyst for Zinzendorf, right? If you've ever wondered if a piece of art can change someone's life, Zinzendorf would say it did. Because it was a catalyst to a spiritual journey that led to him spending the rest of his life giving away his possessions and rather than just living a neat, tidy, religious life, like helping start a movement of church called the Moravians. But it began with the, that slowed down in the moment, and all the travel and all the success, like slowing down and really paying attention to the way of Jesus and how it stands in contrast to our systems. And when we come to the Lord's table, when we come to a place called communion, I think that's what we're, what's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do in this space to slow ourselves down and to really pay attention to, to how the way of Jesus invites us to a better picture of grace and freedom and love than ones we could, could, could identify in our culture and time. But, but, but to invite us to receive it and to challenge us really to walk in it. That's what communion does. It's a moment for us not just to have a snack or to get up finally. He's done talking but to really slow ourselves down for a moment and say, God, would you really help me to see and to receive what your love really looks like in, in my story and, and what pictures of love I've chosen up to this point to, to, to fill me, to empower me, to, to make me feel like I'm okay. There's four stations in this room, and I just want to invite us to, to ask God to help us know in each of our respective stories what it really would mean today to receive this love in our midst, in our moment, and in our time. Let me pray for you, and then we'll invite you, as you're ready, to go to one of those stations and to partake of the bread and the cup that represent this beautiful verse that just, that Jesus came as a ransom for many. God, that's a profound mystery. I know the theological implications of it and how that all makes sense and how that all carries out, what that really means, what that changes about some of our baseline definitions. God, it's, it's a lot. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it is you're inviting us to a picture of love and grace and mercy that's even bigger than the ones we can imagine for ourselves. God, would you give us a glimpse by remembering who you are of, of the freedom and the life and the love and the rest that you are calling us to? We, we confess together that we need your grace and mercy in our lives and, uh, and pray that you would meet us where we are and uh, encourage us that you are walking with us as that kicks us to some heavier, hard places. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.